Welcome Expedians, my name is Rachel and today we're going to discuss what you need to know about food labels. So we'll go over the nutrition facts label as well as different ingredients and how those relate to your health. So when we look at the nutrition facts label, this becomes really important, uh, especially for people who have specific conditions, health conditions, or specific diets that they have to follow. But it's also really helpful if you just want to know what you're consuming. If it is something prepackaged with a lot of ingredients, this can really help us out. So the first thing I look at is calories in, com in comparison to the servings that I'm actually consuming. And so when we look at the serving size, it's important to note this is not a recommended amount of, of the food to consume, right? It's just a way of breaking down the nutrients so it's easy to understand. And so if I were to look at this container, 230 calories per serving, but I consume three servings of this, which is perfectly reasonable because there's eight in the whole container, right? Then we just go 230 times three, and that would be, uh, I just consume 690 calories. And so matching the calories per serving to figure out what we're actually consuming is important. And you also have to multiply that number by all of the other nutrients on the label here. So if I ate three servings, that would be nine grams of protein instead of three. And then we do that with carbs, fat, so on and so forth. The FDA mandated changes in for the nutrition facts label in 2016 that are to go into effect by 2021. So we may have noticed in recent years that a lot of the labels have changed. They have made the calories in bigger fonts so they're easier to read. They have removed calories from fat as it was noted that the type of fat we're consuming is more important than um, just general calories from fat. They also mandated that vitamin D and potassium be put placed on the labels and that vitamins A and C are no longer required. We tend to get enough vitamin A and C in our diets, but vitamin D and potassium uh, tend to be lower. So they wanted to bring those nutrients to our, to our awareness. We'll also see added sugars instead of just total sugar on the labels. And we'll talk more about that in coming slides. And then something else we see here, percent daily value. So the different percentages next to our nutrients is based on a 2000 calorie diet. So it's a good general guideline to go off of. While it might not be the exact amount of nutrients you should consume, because of course that depends on the person. So with this information, if you're someone who's following a specific diet or you're just curious about the product, trying to make healthier decisions, knowing how to read the label and compare the servings to what you would typically consume is important. So how do they actually come up with the calories on food labels? This is kind of interesting. It was originally determined by actually sealing containers of food and they would be surrounded by water and placed in something called a bomb calorimeter which essentially just burned the food up and then the measured rise in temperature um, would determine how much energy was in the food. Now, this is quite a process, so obviously they can't do this with everything nowadays. So based on these bomb calorimeter measurements that they did, they averaged out how much, um, how much rise in temperature or how much energy is produced by the following energy producing nutrients. So we have about four calories per gram coming from carbohydrates. Similar for protein, about four calories per gram, nine calories per gram of fat, and about seven calories per gram of alcohol. And so we might remember back to kind of in the 1980s when, you know, fat was kind of vilified um, as what's, you know, causing obesity in America. And I think this had a lot to do with it. We just recognize that it's a really dense nutrient. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's you know, causing us to gain weight, right? Because there's a lot of other factors. But that's kind of how they determine calories these days is these averages, four calories per gram, nine calories per, per gram. And this is called the at water system. All right, so 
something really important to, to look at on our food labels is sodium, uh, which is salt. It's just another word, word for salt, right? So the recommended daily allowance for average Americans is about 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams per day. And why is salt important, right? So salt has a lot to do with our fluid regulation in the body, um, also known as osmolality, which is just the balance of solutes and water. Solutes being things like sodium, sugar, and other things that dissolve in water. So if we look over at the picture here, osmosis, which is the movement of water, we can see as the solute increases in a solution, our water has to go and dilute that solute in order to maintain the, um, the balance of fluid in our cells, right? So how this relates to salt in the diet is when we, when we consume more salt, our body has to keep that fluid solute balance at all times, right, osmolality. So when we consume more salt, that causes our body to hold on to more water in order to balance out that solution. And this can therefore increase our blood pressure because if you're consuming more salt, there's gonna be more flowing through, your, flowing through your blood vessels. And so we need more water to dilute that out. And then that extra volume increases the blood pressure, right? Which as we know, can be really hard on our vascular system and increase our risk for cardiovascular disease. So that's kind of the main reason too much salt in the diet can be harmful, right? It's, it's much, much less likely that we have too little salt, um, but it has happened and that is a concern as well because we do need a certain amount of sodium, right? We do need salt in order to maintain this, this balance, but too much salt in the diet is, is a much larger concern. All right, so high salt foods. Some of these might be more obvious to you. Um, canned products such as Spam, uh, chips, prepackaged crackers and products like that. Um, highly processed meats such, such as sausage and hot dogs are often very high in salt. Um, bacon, of course, is, not, is another big one. And then it kind of hides in some foods as well. But a good general rule of thumb is when it's really shelf stable, um, often it is salt or sugar additives that are decreasing the water content to therefore make it shelf stable. So um, tortilla shells is another one that I found is, is kind of sneaky in how much salt is in it. So you can't always taste it, right? Sometimes salt can be very sneaky. As far as ingredients to look for on a food label, pretty much anything that has sodium in the name is going to be a kind of salt, right? Uh, fleur de sel is, I believe, a French name for salt. Um, monosodium glutamate, or MSG, bisodium carbonate, these are all different kinds of salt. All right, so potassium. Potassium is huge in regulating our blood pressure because it can actually help your kidneys remove extra salt from the body. So having a balance of potassium foods, especially on those days where, I mean, we all tend to overconsume salt, right? Or most of us do. And so especially on those days where you've had a lot of prepackaged products, lots of canned foods, not a lot of cooking, um, throw some more potassium foods in your diet can be really helpful. So some obvious ones would be bananas, some other great potassium foods, apricots, avocados, almonds, sardines, white beans, there's no shortage of high potassium foods. You've got a lot of options here. Um, I made a little note about using whole foods for potassium sources and not supplements. And that is really important just because using salt substitutes or actual potassium supplements can be very harmful for the body because ex excess potassium can actually cause abnormal heart rhythms. And so we don't wanna do that. Getting it from your foods, it's much, much less likely that you will overabsorb potassium in the body. And so we're pretty safe with our potassium foods, less so with supplements. So definitely talk to your doctor before starting a potassium supplement. All right. Ooh, added sugar. This is another fun one. So as far as how much total sugar in the diet each person should consume, there, there's less guidelines 
structured guidelines around this because it really depends on the person and their activity level and a lot of different factors. But added sugar we find is much more dense and is something that we do want to limit in our in our daily consumption. So they added that on the label. As far as added sugar, it's recommended that we consume no more than 36 grams per day or nine teaspoons according to the American Heart Association. Um, the FDA guidelines on the actual food labels are a little more lenient. They base this off of 50 grams a day or 12 teaspoons. And they did this really just to make it more, you know, realistic for Americans to follow because if you look at my note right below there, we'll see the average American consumption is around 71 grams or 17 teaspoons, almost double the Amer American Heart Association recommendations, right? So the FDA guidelines is definitely an, an easier starting point if, if you're someone that does consume a lot of added sugar. And so if I look at the label in this percentage of our daily value over here of the added sugars, that 20% is going to be based off of the FDA guidelines of 50 grams. So in the ingredients list, what is added sugar? Um, pretty much anything that ends in toast or extrin in the name is going to be a type of sugar. Um, honey, believe it or not, while it is, you know, naturally occurring, most sugars are naturally occurring, um, if it's added to a processed product is considered added sugar. Dextrose, fructose, anything that says syrup or juice crystals, cane crystals, these are all different kinds of sugar. All right, is all sugar the same? This is a question I get a lot um, as a dietitian, and <laughs> the answer is yes and no, which I know is super unhelpful, but let me explain. So um, when glucose, whether it's dextrin or sucrose or fructose, eventually will become either glucose in our bloodstream to use for energy or, or fat stored in the body. It's gonna become one of those two things. So in that way, all sugar does kind of end up being the same thing in our body. Um, it's also the primary energy source for glucose, that is, for most of our organ systems. So we don't want to avoid sugar entirely, right? Um, whole food sugar is combined with other components that slow digestion and satisfy our hunger. So in a way, no, sugar is not all the same because when we get sugar from an apple, we're also getting lots of vitamin C, we're getting fiber, and it's less concentrated versus if you check out the picture of the donut, um, you know, per bite, I'm going to be getting a lot more sugar than I am from that apple. So in whole food forms, it tends to be, sugar tends to be less concentrated. And we also get vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, phytochemicals and antioxidants from whole food sources of sugar that we don't get from, from processed foods and, and added sugar. So yes and no. <laughs> sugar t becomes the same thing in the body, but how it becomes that and the other components that we consume with whole foods make a big difference. Fiber ingredients. So on the ingredients list, if you've ever seen uh, cellulose or guar gum. These are types of fiber that have been isolated from plant products. And it's important to note that they don't make a, that they shouldn't be used as a replacement for uh, eating whole foods because we often process fiber in its whole food form much better than we do when it's isolated from the product itself. Sometimes it's just harder to digest in these forms. So you'll notice that these ingredients tend to be lower on the ingredients list as they're used in really small amounts. Sometimes they're used to actually add fiber to a product. Other times they're used as a bulking or stabilizing agent um, or a thickener. All right, so some other labeling terms that you'll see on food labels. Um, protein ingredients, so soy, protein isolate, casein, whey, collagen, gluten, these are all different forms of protein from different foods that have been isolated out and added to a packaged product. Um, these are all perfectly healthy sources of protein. Something to keep in mind with prepackaged products and 
you know, protein powders and that kind of thing is getting a variety of amino acids and, and proteins because we digest protein a little bit differently and getting um, all of our essential amino acids every day is important for not only maintaining your muscle, but other functions in the body. And so if you have soy protein isolate three times a day, I would definitely consider that less balanced and less healthy than if you're mixing that up with some whole food sources like fish and chicken, or you know maybe some dairy products that contain casein and whey, that kind of thing. Um, another term you'll see on food labels, hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated. Um, these, these are terms that refer to plant oils that are processed to become solid at room temperature. Most oils we see, canola oil, olive oil, avocado oil, they're all liquid at room temperature, right? All those plant oils, aside from coconut oil, which we'll talk about. Um, and so hydrogenating them is a process to highly refine them and make them solid at room temperature. And what that does is it adds a lot of trans fat, which is very negatively associated with cell function in the body. And so avoiding hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated foods, if you see those ingredients on the ingredients list, um, it's, it's not a very healthy product and I would recommend avoiding it. Uh, enriched, <laughs> boo. So <laughs> I don't love the term enriched. Um, it often means that a lot of the whole food components were taken out. Um, and I will say there are some, some benefits to enriched foods, possibly for pregnant women or getting immediate energy because they do tend to add a lot of folate and B vitamins when, when you see that term enriched. Um, but when they do that, the process of it, they end up taking a lot more fiber and vitamins away than they actually add back in. So enriched doesn't necessarily mean you're getting more nutrition. A question I get a lot is, does number of ingredients on the label matter? And often people are wondering whether a shorter list of ingredients means a healthier product. And uh, I would say not necessarily. Um, it's definitely possible that there's a correlation there. But I think more important than looking at the number of ingredients on your products is looking at your diet and your shopping cart as a whole and looking at how many, you know, prepackaged products do I have versus whole foods? And that could be frozen or fresh whole foods, but that'll give you a better idea of, you know, am I over consuming salt and sugar versus just looking at the ingredients list? And then when you are looking at the ingredients list, also compare it to the nutrition facts to make the best informed decision you can based on the nutrients that are important to you and your health. All right, so in conclusion, when we're looking at nutrition labels, be sure we're checking the nutrition facts and comparing it to the number of servings that you're consuming in order to pay attention to the nutrients that are relevant to you and your nutrition goals. Making sure we're not only eating prepackaged products, but also looking at fresh or frozen foods over those really shelf stable foods because they tend to have a lot less salt and added sugar and a lot more fiber, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, other nutrients that are really important for our health. Having that salt and potassium food balance is really helpful for our blood pressure. So if you do enjoy some really salty foods, be sure to get some potassium foods in your diet daily as well. And then it's not all about the total calories, right? Looking at added sugars on the food label, once those labels are all updated as of 2021, yay. Having that balance, making sure that you're getting a decent amount of protein, fats, and fiber in your diet in order to keep our energy throughout the day and have that nutritional balance. So that is it, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I will turn the camera back on here and see if I can open up the chat and throw some questions in there. What kind of questions do you have? 
All right, so here is a question. For protein, are beans, legumes, et cetera, just as valid as animal sources? Only mentioned animal protein sources. Uh, that's a really good point. Um, I did mostly mention animal protein sources. And um, proteins from plant products are absolutely just as valid as, as animal proteins. Um, where it becomes more difficult with a vegetarian or a vegan diet to get our protein is that almost, almost all protein sources from plant products are not complete proteins. And what that means is they don't have all of our essential amino acids in them, um, which if I you know, consume chicken or fish or eggs, all of those are complete proteins and they have every single one of my essential amino acids, which not only help with muscle building, but other functions in the body. Um, so what's important with a vegetarian or a vegan diet is not necessarily that you have to eat meat by any means, um, but to be combining different protein sources um, so not just relying on, you know, black beans, but um, consuming beans and quinoa and nuts and different sources that have different kinds of protein. So just getting a variety of different foods is the most impo important thing. Um, and if you're looking for vegetarian sources that are higher in protein, um, edamame is a big one. Edamame and soy products, those are really high in protein. Um, and then if you eat dairy, whey protein and, or Greek yogurt and cottage cheese are really high sources as well. Tempeh, these are all great vegetarian sources of protein. All right, what specific flours are good to look for in bread or what kinds of flour are good to avoid? Whole grain flour, you're going to get a lot more vitamins, minerals, and a little bit of fiber in that versus if you use enriched or bleached flour. Um, so I'd go whole grain over enriched, enriched or bleached. Almond flour is also a great one and it's much higher in fat and lower in carbohydrates if that's something that you're concerned about. Um, so the only flours I would really avoid are the ones where you see enriched and bleached on the label. Um, you don't have to avoid, avoid them entirely. It's all food, it's all perfectly fine in moderation but I would lean more towards the whole grain flours or almond flour or something like that. Does the body respond differently to natural sugars and manufactured sugars? I, there are different processes in the body that convert sugar into glucose differently. So fructose, for example, has to go through an extra process in order to be converted into glucose. Um, so there was thought for a while that it could be helpful for people with type 2 diabetes um, who consume more fructose than, than direct glucose, other sugar sources, because it has to go through that extra process. So the idea was that it wouldn't spike blood sugar. But they found it wasn't actually helpful overall in helping with the disease or, or preventing overweight and obesity because it still comes down to that calories in and calories out. And if they're still consuming the same amount of calories, there's not a whole lot of difference in the different kinds of sugars because they all eventually end up being turned into either glucose or a storage form of fat in the body. Um, so as far as does the body respond differently to different kinds of sugars, overall I would say no. It's more important how much you're consuming and, and focusing on those whole food products so that you're also getting fiber and vitamins and minerals. All right. Looks like that's all our questions, everybody. Thank you so much for joining and thanks so much for coming.